Hey everybody, Michael Donahue here for Riot Monkey Radio. So, uh, I have a tendency to get ridiculously over verbose, and rather than do that, I am just going to say that I cannot actually put into words how truly, genuinely happy this episode that you're about to listen to made me, because I discovered this fellow at a really formative point in my life when I had just had the reins taken off of me. I think I said in the last episode that uh, I was raised so religiously that I could only watch PG until I was in fact 13 in most occasions. The reins had only been kind of removed for a year or two at the time I discovered this guy and I was watching this show called Oz and I didn't know what it was and I was in the hotel at the time. I had access to HBO so you know. That's what you do. The family's asleep. You watch HBO. <laughs> the end of this guy's arc was just something that left a very deep, very real, very impactful impression on me. You know, I could keep talking, but rather than do that, I'm just going to say, ladies and gentlemen, I got to interview Fred Kohler. And if you are unfamiliar with the man... I apologize, and you need to rectify that as quickly as possible. And in order to help you with that, please enjoy my interview with Fred Kohler. Yeah, hey, uh, I am Michael Donahue, and I am sitting here with... Frederick Kohler. And uh, we are here today to discuss not just his uh, long and illustrious career, but also specifically his film, The Evil Within, that screened at Street Fest this year. As you drop in, the topic of conversation is writer-director of The Evil Within, Andrew Getty saying struck me as somewhat tortured okay uh he was temperamental he was mercurial he would be in a bad mood one moment and then the next moment be really jovial and charming and the thing about him um that was somewhat disarming is that either of those polarities were really really strong when he was charming he was the most charming guy in the room okay and when he was not, he was not. And you kind of never really felt like you were on steady ground with him, at least I didn't. And I think that I had one of the better relationships with him of, of the people that he worked with. Okay. The, the, the funny thing about it is that for me, it was probably, well, not probably, it was the most unique film experience I've ever had. Uh, the irony of that is that it was, you know, getting involved with it was extraordinarily pedestrian. I got a, an audition for a film. Okay. That, that was it. And went in and did it and read the, read the script and was really taken by it. Um, did you get it ahead of time? Or what, did you know what you were auditioning for? Did somebody just call you with an audition? I think somebody called me with an audition. Um, and I got sides okay. that were not directly um, including I included in a script. So I don't think that I... If I remember correctly, I didn't actually get a full script. Okay. I think I got a couple of scenes. I think those scenes entailed... Two different versions of Dennis. One was Dennis uh, before the uh, appearance of his alter ego. Okay. And then the other was post that. So it was a, an audition that was asking me to play both sides of him. Okay. Went in, did the audition, had not met Andrew. It was me and a casting person. Um, and then about a week or so later, if I remember correctly, I got a phone call asking if I would come up to the house and meet with him for a callback. Uh, which... From my experience, is pretty rare. Um, I, I don't normally get invited to the director's home or the producer's home for an actual audition. So I went up to his house, which ultimately was the house that we shot the film in. Oh, yeah, that's a... And that, that is a character almost in itself. It is a character in itself. Uh, and the history of that house is really interesting. Well, I have to get into that. Um, and I went, and there were other guys there who were there for a callback. And they brought me out to this kind of outdoor patio area where Andrew was sitting chain smoking. And it was Andrew and his, uh, and the casting person who I had met earlier and one of Andrew's producing partners. And we sat and I read with the caster and we talked for about five minutes. And he um, gave me a script. And he said, listen, go back and, and read the script and, you know, let me know what you think about it. And I went back read the script, and was kind of dumbfounded by it. I mean, the, the version that is ultimately on the screen... How different is that from what you read? Because what's up on the screen is just a dream, nightmare, amazing montage. That's the same. I think that... I, I think that the, the... Look, one of the things that I think is, is actually um, exciting about where, you know, how the film has kind of ended up is that I think that it... The... the, the 
clarity of his vision, if you can call it that, is intact. I don't think that that has changed drastically. Okay. The, the script that I read is something like 130 pages. Oh, wow. Okay. It's a much more um, verbose, elaborate, almost like... You know how sometimes writers go through kind of a draft and then they have to revise it for a shooting draft because you can't shoot every single idea that, that generally comes on. As that much was, as you want to. That was not his case. His case was, this is it. This is 130 pages. This is what it is. So there are dream sequences in it that didn't make the final cut. There are probably a few scenes between me and Michael that didn't end up in the final, Michael Berryman that didn't end right. up in the cut, right. but nothing that would be intrinsically different from what the final product is. All right. But I was dumbfounded by the script. I mean, it. I read it, and it was unlike anything that I've read subsequent or before. The final film feels that way, too, because it's, it's definitely one that's hard to digest. It's not, like, like you were saying earlier, it, it, it almost begs you to watch it two, three, four times. To kind of pick it apart. Listen, Andrew was an, one of the things that that bothers me is when people talk about this being and and, and people uh, from what I understand have is that they they have said that this is a vanity project that this was you know okay some kind of a, a rich oil heirs project and he just kind of uh, you know was stroking his own ego with it and that I can tell you is completely not the truth for these reasons. One is that. He was completely and utterly devoted to it. There was no uh, parceling off responsibility to anybody. Uh, it was his. His fingers, his ideas, his blood, sweat, and ultimately his money were involved in every aspect of it. From the writing, the producing, the directing. I mean, he would really dictate where the camera was, what kind of shot he wanted, what it should look like, what the sound was... The special effects was something that he was remarkably in tune with. A dude who absolutely knew what absolutely. was Absolutely. Yeah. Even if he couldn't bring it to fruition, he had such an idea and the meticulousness of his idea that when he was around specifically the special effects guys, he would, it, almost as if he was one of them in the shop with them, overseeing exactly what he wanted done. So in that regard... I tend to think of him as more of just this kind of, you know, mad scientist artist. I mean, he, who, who had the ability to finance what it was that he wanted. And I think that unlike most horror films, most genre films, this is ultimately, I think, a very personal story. Um, it absolutely feels it. It's a character piece, which yeah. is always the best kind of film to me. And, you know, there are elements of it that are, that kind of jump genre in a way, because I watch it... And it does feel like a horror movie at times, and at other times it feels like a psychological thriller at times. Other times it does feel like a character study. And then sometimes it feels like an experimental film. 100%. And yeah. all of those things intertwined, I think, really do actually capture the spirit of the original script. Because the spirit of that was this kind of unique peek into his mind, into his soul, really. Which I do think stands up. I do think it kind of has tested a five-year production schedule, and then a 10-year post-production schedule, and ultimately, sadly, his death. Yeah. And the fact that the people who got it finished got it finished at all is a testament to, I mean, the people's dedication to him and to, to, to the art of, of the finished product. And I guess that since we were just talking about special effects, we could jump into that because, uh, huge spoilers, the special effects in this thing are just next-level bonkers. I mean, some, some of them are like, all right, if I'm going to keep it 100% honest, there, there were some of the special effects, for instance, when uh, the Sklar brother comes out of the mirror and slits his own throat and morphs, uh -huh. morphs into you. Uh -huh. I was like, I love, because like, I had heard that, that he did some of the special effects himself. I'm like, on that level, I'm like, that was awesome. But like, when you compare that effect to the marionette show at the end, it's to, to me, the, the quality is just so different. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think partially that has a lot to do with the fact that he wasn't formally trained in any of these things. One of the things that he was really, really insistent on is that he wanted no, no effects that were uh, outside of camera. I don't know okay. how much that shifted during post, but one of the things that he was very insistent on was that he wanted these effects to have a grittiness to them that that belied really, in a way, modern filmmaking. I mean, most things now are very expensive CGI, computer-generated stuff. 
everything. And is that's CG. not that's not what turned him on, visually even. I mean, what the the movies that he really liked were like early John Carpenter. Yeah, yeah. He, he enjoyed, I think, the visceral experience as an audience member of those films, where you actually feel like the thing is a real thing, and your mind allows you to fill in the gaps of maybe something that's a little wonky or moves a little weird, or you know, you you forgive that. And as the you know when it's lit properly, and it it's, works. It's shadow yes. and and it always feels more real because the person in the scene is reacting to something that is in front of them as opposed to a dot or a tennis ball. Totally. Like, yeah. Totally. Um, I think though that you know what you're talking about is there is I think a little bit of a window of 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 these you know discrepancies between certain effects than other effects. I think a lot of that is his own experimentalism. I mean, one of the things when I was talking earlier about uh, some of the stuff that may or, that may have been left out of the the final uh, cut of the film is not stuff that we didn't attempt to shoot. Okay. All so right. that's one thing to always keep in mind is that he set out with that one hundred and thirty page, one hundred and twenty five page script to shoot every bit of it, and, and we and tried. He did. Okay. We tried. I mean, there, there are, there's this one sequence that we did that he called Negative World. And it was right. supposed to all look like the, a negative photo image. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Now, the way he shot this, my understanding, is completely counter to the way that most filmmakers would try to shoot that. Okay. He painted us all white. Really? With this translucent paint. And he blacklit us, and we had light bulbs in our mouths, oh, and wow. it was this really weird, almost choreographed dance piece that occurs in Dennis's dream, where he wakes up and he's in a flip world of his own reality, and it looks like a like a photo negative, and we shot that for days. It sounds like it sounds like it would fit perfectly. Like like you, you hear that, like removed from any kind of context, you're like what movie would that ever be in and why? Yeah. But within the film that is The Evil Within, it that would have fit perfectly. I think in yeah. context it does, but I think one of the things that ultimately he ran into, and I don't think that this was the only example of that, is that ultimately he couldn't make it work visually. It just there, were, there were certain things that either he didn't have the acumen to do, or he didn't have... Um, and this I admire about him. I don't necessarily think that he had the desire to do it the easy way. Understood. There was nothing about him that was, that took enjoyment from taking a shortcut. Okay. And hence, five years of production and ten years of post. Yeah. There, there was a certain thing about his personality that I think he really enjoyed the process of filmmaking okay. as much, if not more, than whatever it would be the final product ended up to be. Totally, um, yeah. So the joy of failing for him, trying to make some big set piece sequence work, whether it did or not, it it wouldn't really occur to him to shoot it. And I saw on various occasions either a cinematographer or a special effects guy or even me at various points be like, look, if we do it this way, we'll be actually be able to do it. And him completely put the kibosh on that. It It didn't interest him to do it any other way than his brain dictated that's how it should be done so like like to his detriment he was a man of his vision which is like you, you have to admire that you is that, admire I mean, is that, I mean is that what you're getting at I mean, is that did i, I misinterpret that i'm sorry no listen okay. I, I i think it, it, there, there's there's no part of me that can discuss this without it being complicated okay it, well, it's, all, it's all complicated right so for me I look at I look at what we were just discussing, and I think yes, there is there is something amazingly admirable about that. I mean, I think we live in a world today where artist visions are compromised left and right. Always. That's that's just that that we we come to accept that it's always. Yeah. We just come to accept it. Yeah. And it's admirable to watch a guy who has put everything on the line in order to achieve that and in order to pursue that, because that is, if nothing else, rare. 100%. And the just... caveat of okay. that, though, is that when you are in that work environment, it's extraordinarily difficult and extraordinarily frustrating at times to be able to do it. I mean, I think that the original production schedule was two and a half months. 
and it ended up being okay. five years. Yeah, that's the whole. And whole with the stops and the starts and and. So know, how, like, what was the, how long? How what was the longest break you took between actually? Because you said five years, but that wasn't five years every day, right? No, God, no, 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 no. <laughs> it was. I I want to say we did. I think three major productions. Okay. Like. Stop, start to finish. We did three major ones, and each of those probably lasted uh, at least two to three months. And then he would take a couple years or a year off in between. So you essentially shot three full movies. Well, we had three different casts. <laughs> three different ca- I was about to ask, was it the same cast no, at the time? No, it was no? not. It was not. We started... Okay. I think the only two. Uh, how much can you talk about that? Like, I mean, like... without naming without naming names of the of the actors who dropped out, we I think the only major characters who stayed from the beginning all the way to the end were Michael Berryman, Kim Darby, and myself. Okay. We had different Johns, different Lydias, and we're so fortunate ultimately to get Sean and Dina, who were incredible by the end of it. Oh yeah. Um, so I would go and shoot, and, and I, I started shooting this, and had a, we had a different cast, and I think we shot for about two and a half months, and then shut down completely, and I thought the movie was dead. I thought it was done. Okay. Um, and a long time went by, and then he uh, wanted to remount it. He wanted to redo it, wanted, or keep what he shot that was usable, and then... Redo the rest. Redo the rest. And we tried to do that. And again, we had another cast because the actors had dropped out or were in some other experience or had had enough or whatever. And pretty much the same situation happened. We had another two-month, let's say, shooting schedule, made it through, and then he stopped production again for another, let's say, year and a half, two years. Was was this him displeased with the product that he got out of those two and a half months or was it just, I want to refine it more than I was able to right now? Uh, I think it was a combination of a lot of things. I think one, because he was self financing it, he would run out of money and then he'd have to get more. I think that, um, there were a lot of problems on set. There was a lot of disconnect between him and the crews. I don't think it was the best, easiest work environment. Um, he could be hard to work with and hard to work for. Okay. Um, and I think he alienated a lot of people for that. Um, there was also a push for the crew to be union, which it didn't start out union. All right, that's definitely... Um, so that was yeah. part of it. Because of his, to get to your, your other point, because his vision was so... Uh, because he was constantly so true to his vision, we would show up and the, they, you would think that they had worked out what we were doing that day, and he would literally walk on set, cameras up, lighting's done, I'm there in costume ready to act, and he would go in and look around and go, this isn't what I want, and walk out, and we would have days of no shooting. Oh, fun. So all of those things incorporated, I think, to a really long so shooting what, schedule. Did he have issues in communicating what his vision was, or did he just expect people to pull it out of his brain for him? I think both. Okay. I think both. I think that, I mean, listen, he and I would have one of the... Uh, and I'm getting somewhere with this, so bear with me. But, you know, very often I would show up to set somewhere between 6, 7 a.m. Okay. And there'd be a knock on my trailer door and his either his assistant or one of the PAs would say, hey, listen, if you have a second before we start filming, Andrew would like to see you up, up in his uh, kitchen area. Andrew held court kind of at this very long table in the uh, dining room. And he had monitors there and that's where he would kind of direct from. He was very rarely on set. Okay. He just kind of hung out at the table? He hung out at the table and he watched, and he had what, what they call a god mic. So he could right. he could direct that way. Because one of the things about the house is that it's actually quite claustrophobic. The, the room... It looks big, but you're saying it, it the, feels the, small. It is, it is big, but when you put camera and crew and actors and lights Understood. and all of these things, it could get really kind of claustrophobic. And Andrew's a really big guy. He's close to 6'5", oh, wow. barrel-chested, and almost Hemingway-esque okay. in, his, in his demeanor. So a man of that size, kind of, you know, it wasn't an easy experience for him to be there. So he would call me up to his dining room table. And I'd go up there, and he'd be there chain-smoking with a coffee, and he'd get me a coffee, and we'd sit. And we would talk about the film. We would talk about tone, and we would talk about um, mood, and we would talk about 
things that kind of had inspired him and what he was looking for in this. And we would talk about character a little bit. And very often, I would walk away from those meetings more confused than when I had oh, no. sat down. That is the opposite of what you want to hear. You know, it is, Michael, <laughs> but in a way, I think all of these things are kind of the ingredients that went into the film. I mean, there is an unsteadiness about the movie. Which is one of the things I really like about it. And I think that's partially... I don't want to. I don't want to sound omniscient to, th to to say that this was intentional. I don't necessarily think that it was, but I think that they, all of these things are absorbed into the celluloid of it. I mean, it's it's a it, it's a film that relies on the audience being unsteady. I think it relied on me being unsteady. I think it relied on the crew being somewhat confused. I think to an extent Andrew was a little not confused in what he wanted, but sometimes confused in how to get it. That and, makes total sense. And maybe confused in how to communicate it. I've, I've said about a lot of artists, you, you hear that certain people are difficult to work with, but then you see their work, and whether or not you appreciate the art that comes out of it, it you know, like, like big blockbusters that people like to get mad at, they're, they're, there's absolutely a market for them, and they don't get made without a certain level of assurity. And when you get to that level of assurity, and people don't give you what you want, you... Don't have, you no longer have the ability to understand why that is when you're at the level that you're at. Sure. Did, did those words make sense? Yes. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and, I, and I think that that's true. I mean, I, I don't really think that anybody who worked on the film at any point ultimately got what they initially expected. I think that we all walked into this with almost a, a, a pedestrian view of, oh, we're doing a horror movie... We're doing it, you know, I mean, the budget on it was not what it ended up being. So we thought that it was, you know, a pretty, not super low budget, but a low budget horror movie right. with this guy who wrote it and is directing it and he's shooting it out of his house to save money and, like, we'll be done in 30 days. Like, it's <laughs> not, you know, it, it, there was no way to really prognosticate that this was going to be... A 15-year process. A 15-year project. And not just that, but the kind of emotional ramifications that ultimately come with it because he died, because it was a 15-year project. I mean, there are people on that film that I've known now for 15 years that are friends. And that we were in this kind of really crazy experience together. It, the, the film has a weight to it because of all of those things that there was no way to envision it happening. And I think you actually see some of that in it. Um, and that's kind of weird. That's kind of special. Regardless of what, you know, an audience thinks of it or a critic thinks of it, there is something interesting there that I think is due not just to what the um, surface content of it is, but the backstory of it actually causing some kind of uh, artistic echo in the film, I think makes it somewhat special. I'm not comparing the films, but there's something remarkable about Apocalypse Now with that. There, the, you know, Apocalypse Now is not just a war movie. At all. It, it's a war movie, but it's also this amazing rendition of a director's tale, and it's based on a book, and all of this stuff that goes into the fact that they shot it for so long in the Philippines, oh, yeah. in the jungle, with, you know... Martin Sheen having a heart attack, and Lawrence Fishburne being 14. Yeah, and like, I haven't watched the documentary this, yet, but I've got, I've got the dossier edition over here. All of this yeah. stuff, you know, goes into it. It's undeniably a part of what ends up on screen, and I'm guessing that nobody ever thought that that kind of, those qualities would be some kind of, like, through osmosis end up in the film, but it kind of has a way of doing that. And this, I think, I think The Evil Within does actually have certain things that would only be present in it because of the, 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 the history of it, the filming of it, the actual production of it, the difficulties of it. Well, I, 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 on my first viewing, like, maybe 15 minutes in, rather than trying to, like, figure out what it was, I was just letting it happen and enjoying the crazy nonsense that was unfolding, and I, and, I, and I just wrote down a note that wound up summing up the movie as a whole to me, which was, this movie's like a fucked up collection of nightmares that I don't want to end. Like, it, yeah. it, because, like, you know, if you try to tell somebody what the movie's about, like, you can tell them at the core what, what the film is, but, like, that's not what the film's about, you know? 
I mean, I think at the end of the day, there is not a single thing in it that is not somehow representative of Andrew. From the content of the script, certainly, to visually what it looks like, what it sounds like, and, and I think ultimately what it feels like. I mean, I think that there are, there's nothing about the film that is not a personal story. And I think in a way, if you really wrap your brain around that, that this is this film is the personal story of this guy who wrote this script. That is really unsettling. I mean, I think that if if you if you make the leap that this in a way is somehow his story, whether it's allegorical, whether it's symbolic, or you know, it certainly isn't realistic. Okay. It, it's not a realistic <laughs> depiction of his life. But there are there is an emotional content to it, a vulnerability to it, an unsettling quality to it that he's for whatever reason, resonated for him. And he felt, I mean, look, the guy could have made a film about anything. And he chose that. Was this something that had been gestating in his brain for like a really, really long time? Was this like, the, like he was like, I wrote one script and I need to make this thing? Or is he was he always someone who wanted to make films? My understanding um, is that he had script upon scripts that he he's written quite a bit. Okay. Um, none of them I've seen. So I can't. I can't verify that. I know from what I've been told and have heard secondhand that the premise for this film was uh, inspired by night terrors that he had growing up. Okay. So this notion of dreams that don't stop are something that he actually experienced. That growing dreams up. not stopping thing is one of the absolute craziest when you stop to... Because that, that's something that when it happens in the film... Like two, like two or three times, I think that there, there's the mention of did this dream end or not, and and, and you're like, but if that dream didn't end, then which dream is where? And oh, brain exploding, like yeah, and I, I think that um, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but the original title of the film was the storyteller. I was unaware of that. So the the working title, the original draft title, the name of the film, I still have to remind myself to call it the evil within, uh, was the storyteller. And the whole idea of it is kind of based on one of uh, Dennis's lines uh, about halfway through the film where he's talking to John and he says, I don't understand. If a dream is a story you tell yourself, you know, how does this, how does this work? And yeah, that, that you say that, like, it, that's in my notes is one of the, right, since so, so you just brought this up, the, the way that you play Dennis, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of people have reticence immediately upon a person without disabilities who is depicting someone with disabilities. Sure. And uh, just a little bit about me is uh, my mom uh, taught people with disabilities when I was quite young. Okay. So I've been around people like that pretty much my whole life. Like in high school, I was in the Best Buddies program where I had to go have lunch with the, you know, the, the, the disability class. Sure. And when I was in like wood shop and theater, like when they would come on, I, I'd, be, I'd be their little helper and make, yeah. you know, overseer and stuff. So one of the things, like, with, with the way the film opened, like, at, at about five, ten minutes after the opening of the film, like, I kind of forgot that it opens with, we'll call it normal narration. Mm -hmm. When his inner voice came out and, and initially was normal, like, I felt a little betrayed because up until that point, I, if you had told, if I wasn't aware that you are the actor that you are, you could have told me that that character, that that person was a real person with disabilities and I would have bought it. Okay. So the reality of someone without the ability to really cognize what is happening attempting to cognize what is happening. It was so heartbreaking at so many times. And like the line you just talk about is, is one of them. And the one where, uh, you know, you're like, people think I'm dumb or where, where, where you ask, uh, you know, you ask your brother, like, do you think I'm retarded? Or the, like the ultimate was when you're uh, trying to get the, when you're asking the ice cream parlor girl mm -hmm. to, to write the note for mm -hmm. you. And you're like, this is exactly how this would go. And it's not going to go your way. This is so uncomfortable. Like, the film in general is amazing, but without you, I do not think it works. Thank you. So, I, listen. I think that I think that the um, reaction to this idea that uh, we said a lot, so let's cut. Let's let's try to break all of that yeah. into pieces. First of all, I absolutely understand um, uh, there being a certain backlash to a, um, a a handicapped character being played by someone who's not handicapped. I understand that. Uh, in my opinion, if this film did not include there being a switch where there's an alter ego that comes through that is violently aggressive and violently intelligent in a way that is completely different from Dennis, 
I think you probably should make the film with a handicapped actor. I, I don't think that there's any reason why you shouldn't. There you go, yeah. Uh, at all. Well, is it, it, it's uh, like another note, I, I, it, it had me hardcore, it kind of lost me, but then by the end it just w- wins me so, so much back. I mean, listen, I, I think that, and I feel this way having having actually met and worked with Andrew, I, I don't, I think it was act, to base a horror movie around a central character who has a mentally handicapped is really intense. Oh, that choice is really intense. Like, we've seen one of my favorite horror movies growing up was Sleepaway Camp. Okay, yeah. And you don't realize it until the end, but the, the killer is a really marginalized, a societally marginalized person. 100%. And the, the, the thing that is feeding their anger is the fact that this is a marginalized person. You don't get get much more marginalized and mo- much more vulnerable in the in the population than somebody who has a man- mental handicap. Hundred percent. That is one of the, the main reasons. I exactly what you're saying. Yes. Now, I don't think I think that that choice is not meant in any way to offend. I think what he wanted to do, and certainly one of the the things that I latched onto is that you are watching somebody who is the most fragile. 100%. Oh, yeah. You are watching somebody who is the most vulnerable. That immediately puts you in a situation where, as an audience member, you should be fucking uncomfortable. There is no reason why you should feel safe in that. You shouldn't feel safe watching him, and you shouldn't feel safe with that notion. And I think that if this were just a film... That was about a kid with a mental handicap who started to who went postal and started killing something. I think that's exploitive. Yeah. I think that the the big victim in the film is Dennis. So yes, he is committing crime, maybe, and we'll get into that. Right. Is that actually happening? But the other side of it is that he's asking you to watch someone who is someone who you should automatically feel a certain amount of, um, not pity, but a certain amount of protection for. You You don't like to see somebody who is so vulnerable be terrorized. I mean, that, you know, you, know, you, you don't like to see somebody hurt a cat. Because right. a cat is vulnerable. Animals are vulnerable. You don't want to see somebody hurt a child. Children are vulnerable. That's by choice. I think that his entire MO with that was to show you things that immediately makes you uncomfortable. The, the, the thing that's so successful about the film, whether you like it or not, and I understand why some people won't, some people don't, right. and I respect that, but the thing about the film is that it completely inhabits the place that it set out to, which is to make you squirm. It's not a conventional horror film with jump scares. At that's all. not the point. There's actually not even a lot of gore in the film. No, it, it no is, not much, but what's there is punchy. What's there is punchy, <laughs> but it doesn't rely on that. I think the thing that it wants to do is get under your skin. And I think it wants to make you feel unsettled and make you squirm. Which is 100% what it does. And I don't know if you have that character be any different than what he is. The film works quite as well. Absolutely. And it's it's, it's like you were saying about the vulnerability of the character. It's like, um, I love, love, love horror films. But um, I, I was disallowed from watching them when I was a child. So by the time I started watching them, as opposed to them affecting me in that, oh my god, I'm so scared, I'm so there, I, I became into the, very uh, into the art of the films, sure. and I find them thrilling and exciting, yeah. but they don't really get me. And it's, and it's you know, with horror and with comedy and sci-fi and like a lesser extent action, like your ability to truly enjoy the film is based on your ability to let go into the situation. Mm-hmm. This is one of those cases where I was able to let myself go. Because of the reality of your performance and just tr- sitting here thinking like, man, like, I mean, I know this is a movie, but if this was real, how intensely painful must it be to be able to know just enough to know that your brain isn't working right and trying to figure out why and how to maneuver in the world in that fashion? Yeah, Andrew and I, Andrew and I um, had discussions. One of the, one of the um, major touchstones that he would bring up for me to think about was Jacob's Ladder. Okay, all right. (laughs) Um, Now, in a really kind of weird, funny way, I feel like The the Evil Within is kind of like three movies 
I would agree. Kind of going on at the same time. I would agree. There's like the movie Andrew's directing. There's the movie I'm in. And then there's Sean and Dean. Yeah, yeah. And their kind of story and their part of it. And in a way, tonally, they're all kind of different. Very. They, they, have, they have different qualities to it. One of the things that I... And I wouldn't say that I was hesitant about it because I felt really um, committed to it from the outset was that I didn't want to play Dennis's handicap as anything less than as realistic as I could. That being said, I wanted it to be somewhat operatic. Okay. So... For me, when you when you started uh, when we started this conversation, where you referenced that sometimes it feels like a character study, I think that might be why. Is that for me, it was it was a lot of research and a lot of videos and a lot of physical and vocal work. I was gonna. So did you you spend time with some people? Or? I I like you spent time with um, learning disabled kids growing up. Okay. Um, and have learning disabled kids in my family. Okay. And also um, did some charity work with the Special Olympics and were around people at varying degrees of mental disability. Now, because that was predominantly through my childhood, the research that I did later and because of the kind of open-ended notion of, of what's going on with Dennis, because he doesn't have um, a born retardation. He's not, he doesn't have Down syndrome. He, it's not a learning disability. He's not it's autistic. Traumatic it's, brain it's, it's injury. It's traumatic brain injury. Yeah. So what is that? And the degrees of that are, the spectrum of that is fairly large. So a lot of that had to do with talking to doctors. I watched videos of people who were suffering from traumatic brain injury. And then kind of sculpting it into a shape that would fit the narrative of the film. And because there is the switch where the other character comes into it, I had to make them as diametrically opposed as possible so that there was kind of an ongoing tension between those two characters once he reveals himself. So I think that, for me, the only thing that I thought would be a real misstep would be to make him somewhat come across as a, as a parody. And that was something that I, without a doubt, was trying to avoid. That was, that was not something that I wanted to do. And so, for me, the emotional content of what he's going through has to be real. If, if you're watching somebody who is mentally handicapped and he is being terrorized, that's what it has to look like. It has to be violent. It has to be ugly. It has to be over the top in moments. It has to be, it has to come from the most primal, organic place. There could be no vanity in it. It, it had to be as, as ugly as possible. And that's how I approached it. I mean, in a way, the film for me feels like uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. I love that movie in, so much. Tra <laughs> trapped in a dream. I mean, it's, it, it is, and I really, like, that, that film for me it was kind of a touchstone in the fact that it's, it is a horror film of sorts, but it is also a character study. Have you seen this? Man Bites Dog? Oh, yes, of course. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I course. just, whenever Serial Killer stuff comes yeah, up, I'm like, course. I have to know. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, the, the way I approached the character was about as realistic as one could get in the format of the film. I mean, it, you know, we very often have seen films um, and really spectacular performances by actors playing people with a mental disability, but they're rarely in horror. I can't think of one where horror exactly. is really... Definitely not in a positive protagonist role. Yeah, not that I can think of. No. Um... <laughs> So it was a the internet was, will prove us wrong, I'm sure. Probably, but, yeah. probably. Um, but I think in that way it was a bit of a unique endeavor. I mean, it was a little bit of a high wire act that way. But to play him faithful, I mean, I never really wanted him to be the butt of the joke ever. I, I always felt like if that if if it ever crosses into that territory, I'm not doing my job. He he, I wanted to play him as realistically as possible, like a real living, breathing guy with some straightforward depiction of how the hell he would possibly react in this situation, which is so operatic and so horrible. The intensity of not just the, the content, but also your performance in, the, in those long takes where you're switching back and forth and talking to like, there's so much dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue. There's so much dialogue. There's I'm a like, lot of dialogue. I'm like, the performance is amazing, but how do you remember this much stuff? Like, the, the, no, that was, I would have to learn it um, as as both characters, so I would spend a day learning it as Dennis, and then come back to it the next day and learn it as the reflection. Okay. And then 
we would just work on it. I mean, I think, look, one of the, one of the benefits that I think ultimately came with, you know, such a long protracted shooting schedule is we would revisit stuff. There are certain scenes where I'm 25 years old and then the next shot of me talking opposite myself, I'm 29. Okay. Like, there, we would, we've left certain scenes unfinished in certain, you know, incarnations of the shoot and would have to revisit it two years later, three years later. Yeah, there's definitely, like, there are, there are a couple points in the film where it's, you know, it, 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 and not a knock on the quality, but there's, there you, can, you can, it feels like it was done, like, later on. And you can tell, yeah. too, because, like, like you said, like, it is four years later, so, like, you're like, Shot Patrick Flannery looked a little different in this shot than he did in the last shot. <laughs> I th- and again, I think that for some people that'll bother. I think and it, like I'm not one of those people that bother at all, uh, but I totally get what you're saying. I, I yeah. think that you know, and this is if if we get into kind of like what the film is actually about and what one can garner from watching it. I think that in a certain light and from a certain perspective, those inconsistencies actually add something really interesting to the film. Because the, the, the level of confusion in yes. in those two characters who have lacked confusion up until that point in the film, it, like the the difference in the feel of everything that is happening, to me, absolutely added to the scene. Yeah. Yeah. So, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I definitely got to ask the that crazy mirror maze thing. Okay. The that that whole scene, the 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 way that it, it it's the it's the real just the sun you're there. And then you're trying to figure out, and the slow realization of if I touch here, I can do this. Yeah. What all like the performances being, but shooting in mirrors is one of the most difficult things I've been told. I've not, never experienced, and that many like how big was that actual maze mirror? Was it was like one tiny little room, or did you so, get a warehouse, or what? So, do? so this is actually a really funny story. Oh, so, yeah. um, when I met you the night at Shriek Fest, I saw Stephen Sheridan, who's the DP. Okay. Now I had not seen him in ten years. Like, easily 10 years. And we were um, waiting to go inside, and we were just chit-chatting, kind of catching up. And he said, do you remember when we shot the mirror maze? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? So we shot the vast majority, I would say 90% of the film, at Andrew's house. Um, and a lot of the sets um, that were not in the script, denoted as his house, were shot on the property. So... The, the, the restaurants that... His backyard or something? It's somewhere there, yeah. Okay. On his property. One of the things that we had to do is we had to shoot certain things off because we needed real proper sets. So monsoons, the, uh, the, the, the Chuck E. Cheese oh, the Chuck E. Cheese thing. Kind of yeah. place, that was a set that was off in a warehouse somewhere. Oh, so that was a set that was in a location? No, that was set. Oh, wow. That was oh, wow. That was all built. Okay. And the mirror maze. Yeah. So, and the basement. The basement where the marionette yes. is at the end. Yes. That's that's a proper set okay. that was built, that was painted. Well, it would have to be if they yeah. did all that stuff in camera. And actually really quite large. So we're out in Silmar, I think, is where the, the warehouse is. And, you know, one of the things that um, was not re- readily a part of our work experience was rehearsal. Okay. <laughs> you know, you would kind of show up on the day and, like, walk through it really quickly and then shoot it. Which, for most shoots, is not really all that strange, except that there were so many technically difficult things to shoot that we were kind of learning on the fly as we went. And sure enough, they built a, they built a mirror base. And it was big. I mean, it was the entire, the entire walk through it is the, the actual walk through it. They're, they're, oh, so that, that, that wasn't cut around flipping and flopping uh, I, and shots? I don't know. I'm sure there's edits there. There's well, yeah. cuts there. But the actual... I just meant like it wasn't like walk down and now turn around and walk the other way we're going to pretend to oh, the same no, 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 no. That's no. what I meant. No. Okay. No, 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 no. I mean, it was probably about 100 feet long and 100 feet wide. Good like, Lord. It was, it was big. That's, and yeah. And it, <laughs> it was actually something with the dim lighting you had to find your way through because there were turns. There were kind of false uh, false routes. It, it, was, it was a little treacherous to kind of okay. navigate and it, it's on this this kind of wooden platform and then all of this glass mirror on top of it built on top of it and wait so you said the, the whole maze is raised is what you're telling me yeah it was on a platform oh good lord so you'd step up onto it yeah okay uh, i'm not not 
huge, but it was probably maybe two, three feet off the ground. Well, I mean, glass isn't light. I mean, that's got no. the structure must have no. been. No. <laughs> well, th this is the point. So I'm talking to I'm talking to uh, Steve Sherrod and the DP, and the way he tells the story is it was him with the steady cam, me, and then a, a, I think a, either I'm, I'm guessing it was a focus puller. Um, and that was it, because once you got onto the platform, there's no room for anything else. Right. And we got up on it, the three of us, and as soon as we all stepped in it, the platform went... Ooh, oh, no, 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 no. And it started to wobble. No, 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 no weeble wobble when you've got that much glass around you, and please. I looked at Steven, <laughs> and I said, Steven, is this thing safe? <laughs> no. And he looked at me, and he goes, ha, ah, yeah, right. <laughs> and apparently my reaction was, all right, fuck it, let's just do it. And we did it, and that was... That was it. it, it At least was, you got it. <laughs> it was, yeah, and I, listen, the funny thing is, is when you're shooting something like that, especially with the circumstances that the, sh that was really towards the end of my uh, participation in the shoot, uh, at the very, very tail end, there, there is a certain amount of like, well, we've made it this far, I can't even imagine how this is going to look, and you see it now, and I think it works. It works really, really well. It looks wonderful. It looks really good, and I think that that is actually a real testament to Andrew's vision. I mean, he saw what we didn't see, because I totally was on that thing, looking at Steve and looking at Andrew and being like, why the fuck are we doing this? This is, this is nuts, and it's not going to work. And it did. Listen, I there eat grow. Go. It works. Right on. Yeah, it 100% works. And it doesn't just work. To me, it's one of the highlights of the entire film. That is a crazy-ass story, man. Right on. Okay, so if you're still listening at this point, major, major spoilers. I'm going to get kind of detailed about the effects at the end of the film because they're so crazy and awesome. But <laughs> my, my, my reaction after seeing the, uh, the glorious chaos that unfolds was, uh, like, I love fucked up weird stuff. I love bizarre puppetry. Jukebox marionette shows are something I've been a fan of. Like I used to watch uh, Shining Time Station when I was a kid. Like, like I don't know if you're familiar. That's like that 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 was the framework that they put Thomas the Tank Engine into at yeah. one point. Yeah. And uh, like one of the things in there was like inside the jukebox is a band of marionettes yeah. that plays all the music. Uh, and like and I and I love practical effects, especially when they're done well. And when the the slow unveiling of all the taxidermy that you've been pulling off throughout the film is showing up as as the puppet show behind you, but you've used uh, the pulley system that you learned about in the pizza joint, and then it just gets bigger and bigger until a spider of limbs comes out. I mean, can you... How much of that was, uh, like, 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 like practical... Like, like, the spider was a, a big old, you know, creation, but... Were some of the taxidermy people, they were just people in makeup, or...? Uh, if I remember correctly, some of them, I, I think that the, um, the vast majority of it was fabrications, I think. And then there was the, um, the actor who plays um, his therapist, who you see actually in the... In the background, In yeah. the background, was the actor. Okay. And he was in, he was in death makeup and, and right. all that. But I, my, my understanding is that the vast majority of it was, was actually fabricated by the, by the special effects team. There, there, I don't think that it ended up working one of the incarnations of the body spider at the end were dancers. Okay. And they were kind of contortionists in this body spider, so the limbs would kind of be sticking out, and they were actual practical limbs of these, of these dancers okay. who had choreographed a way to move and I think the body of it was being lifted by some cables that they were going to, you know, hide somehow. And it would have this weird herky-jerky motion. I don't think that that worked. Okay. <laughs> um, we shot that over the course of several weeks. That really? whole sequence. Yeah. Okay. That was, that was a tough, tough one to pull off. And I don't know by the end of actual photography how much of that was completed. I have a feeling that he did a lot of work on that in post. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. But uh the what what is on the screen is just weird. Glorious it's chaos. Weird. Yeah, di it's totally disgusting chaotic. beauty. Like yeah. 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 Just full of just uh, and, and then your performance as Puppet Master Dennis is just where where the, the, the inner demon just comes full out and he can't uh can never remember Flannery's character's name. John. John. So, uh, that John doesn't pick up on the fact that Dennis is not acting at all like Dennis until he's at that point. And, yeah. and, and, and then he's glued to the chair by the time it's too point. Too, it's too late. So, 
You said that was towards the end of photography? Yeah. Okay, okay, because yeah. I was going to say, because, like, I know, like, sometimes, you know, people, like, we shot the end of the movie at the beginning, so we're supposed to have, no, like, that this was, whole life that was that was really towards the end. I think one of the reasons why is because those two set pieces that we were talking about, the the, um, the mirror maze and the um, the, the finale, yeah. for, for lack of a better term, I think because they were so technically difficult to pull off, he needed as much time to kind of really figure out and plan how to do that. So that was the third incarnation of production, and that was at the very, very end. Okay, yeah. yeah. So then it, it is that, because uh, in that performance I was like, if you did this at the beginning of the film, I don't know where you pulled this life from. Because like the uh, like in the performance as the puppet master, the gnawing, I'm finally free, but I can't let him know just how free yet. Just that gnawing, gnashing beast that's been inside the whole time, finally get, like, the smile that's on your face as you're working Dina Meyer is just, man, uh, your, yeah, your performances are just, are just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm sorry, I've stumbled over my words. No, but... I appreciate it. Definitely. I, um, I, I had a really, well, the, the thing that I remember about uh, approaching that was that I really wanted him to have fun. That th this was the kind of gleeful, this was the moment that he'd been waiting for, and it's a win for him. Yeah. To actually, this is the culmination. And that's that, and that was the emotion and the performance that came out 100. percent Yeah. Cool. Right on, man. What was the best day you had on set? What was the best day I had on set? Um, I really, you know, for me, in retrospect, the thing that I really kind of enjoyed, and this really kind of sounds counterintuitive, but I, I, I was really proud to get through it. I mean, it was, it, the relationships that I made on the film and kind of the, um, the, the ordeal of tackling that character was the thing that I will always kind of take with me. I mean, it, it was a challenge. And it was really, um, I think, fruitful to experience. And the, the hardships that, that happened, and the, you know, the rough days on set were actually worth it. And I'm really glad that 15 years down the line we actually have a film, that people are seeing it. I mean, I think that that's kind of the cool thing about making something. And my hope is that whatever happens with the film, if, if you know, the film goes on to, um, you know, get some, some more audiences to, to see it and people like it, all of that's gravy at this point. I mean, it, it's, it, was, uh, it was a hell of an experience. Absolutely. And it's one of those things, too, like, like you're saying about people getting to see it. Is like, I know there are certain actors who are like, well, I can't watch anything I'm in. I just don't like it. I, I, I understand that, but why make a thing if you don't enjoy the thing that you're making? You know, the thing that's interesting, and if we have time, I'd love to get into it, is what actually is the film. Uh, listen, I, I think it's just, it's always interesting for me to uh, think about what people get from the film. Because it's, it's because I think the narrative is um, fluid, and I think that it's one that's open to interpretation, I have found that you talk to three different people and you're going to get three different answers, really, on what it was that they just saw. 100%, especially when there's three different movies in the movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, for me, the film works best if it's all in Andrew's... Uh, not Andrew, well, I guess, the, okay, there's a the, there's, there's the Freudian slip. I think it, all of it takes place in Dennis's brain in the asylum. Okay. I think all A of very it, Jacob's I, Ladder type scenario. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I, I think that, that, that literally everything that you are watching on film is Dennis's remembrances and thought and and thoughts about you know what has occurred and I think that when you're watching scenes between John and Lydia it's Dennis imagining how those conversations went I think that it's really telling that the two people that Dennis does not actually kill are John and Ice Cream Sue the two characters that he loves yeah there you go um, that he can't kill them. I think that um, all of it's in his head. Just by the way it started, with the little story about the letdown of of, of the of the horror ride, I was like, this whole thing's a dream. Like <laughs> the whole thing yeah. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think because of because of the way Dennis thinks, and because of the 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 actual, I think the trauma to his brain is real. I think there is a guy who does have brain trauma. And his brother stuck him in an stuck him in an asylum. With that plot twist, where where the, the 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 cause of the issue was a traumatic brain injury, that was the point at which I said a little bit earlier, like like when when the ins I had forgotten that it opened with the the standard uh, narration, and when it when it switched to like a no like in quotes normal voice on the inside, like it felt a little 
a little exploitative because I had forgotten that. So when that story point hit, and it was like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's so fucked up. Now it makes total sense. So that, that's the point at which, which it won me back. Like, how does the film work for you? Like, do you do you actually think that we're watching this guy go out and kill animals and then kill kids and then plan this elaborate thing to... There, there's, an ele- there's an element to the film that is kind of a revenge fantasy. I mean, he, he is, by all intents and purposes, ending up with John in the chair from a pretty early start in this film. He's got to be thinking that that's where this is all headed. Absolutely. So do you think that that is... Because it, it's it's interesting because people some people think that this is that Michael Berryman and then ultimately uh, Dennis's reflection are kind of uh, manifestations of Dennis's ego and id or okay. are, is there actually a supernatural aspect to this like is there is he legion is there yeah, some kind of yeah. demonic force that exists in a haunted mirror like what what are we watching. My my personal takeaway, like I, I I love you know paranormal, I love demonic stuff, but uh, I have an undergrad degree in theater and an undergrad degree in psychology. So when the the story has the possibility of being just a complete fabrication within your brain that you that you don't even realize is a fabrication, that's the that's usually the interpretation I will go that towards. That you take. Yeah. So and and it, it's because to me that's always sort of the most interesting. I, 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 are you a Batman fan at all? Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I, I have unconventional favorite villains. Uh, my favorite villains are Victor Zaz and the Ventriloquist. Okay, you're way beyond me. Okay. I don't know any of these. Did you ever watch the Batman the Animated Series? No. Uh, okay, so I liked it as a kid. Yeah. But I'll yeah. say that. Okay. Well, there was the, 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 there's a character named the Ventriloquist. Batman the Animated Series was presented, uh, it was initially supposed to be a primetime animated show. But then, a, a, a little while into production, they were like, well, it's going to be Saturday morning kid stuff. But they still kept, like, the primetime feel, but they just kind of nerfed some of the content. So instead of the Joker going around killing people, he's just making them go crazy, you know what I mean? Okay. But there's this one episode where this, the, this character is introduced, and he's a very small, mousy, diminutive accountant type. And his alter ego is a 1920s mobster ventriloquist dummy. Okay. And the ventriloquist dummy sounds like a 1920s gangster, is violent, like it, it runs crime in the city, but it's just on this, 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 this normal who's just, he looks away while the guy's talking and killing, like, and you're like, this is so crazy. And at one point, Batman is, uh, gets a hold of, uh, uh, like, like a brain scan or something, and he's like, look, there are two personalities. And, and having that kind of content presented to me in something that, I was okay to watch because it was a children's program. Right. Just fascinated me. Sure. Just fascinated me. And so, like, so, you know, since since that time, I've always been into psychological scarring as opposed to physical, I guess would be the yeah. way to say it. Yeah. I mean, I, th- there's, a, there's a really interesting part of the film for me when um, he goes to theoretically kill Ice Cream Sue, and she walks into the... Uh, the uh, back room because she thinks she hears a noise and there's a mouse on the floor dying and then Dennis reveals himself by flipping kind of like parkour style yeah, a little down bit. The thing. <laughs> and there, there for me it feels like such a, a tonal break from what we have seen before for me that's how Dennis sees himself I think that there is a there is a um, kind of romantic superhero villainous quality that he's kind of remembering himself as, thinking of himself as. Okay. Like, I actually think that totally it for me it's a clue into what this is, what is actually happening. That there there are um, and we were talking about this earlier where I was saying that you know some of the things that are the inconsistencies how they how they add to what the final product of the film is. I mean, to me, if, if you're watching someone with a traumatic brain injury, a handicapped brain, retell a story, I think that there are going to be some pretty major... So There's going to be some leeway in kind of the realism to how it's depicted. So if he is stalking this girl especially at that point in the film where the, 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 the villainous aspects of his personality are kind of coming out, he's going to move and behave differently than a normal human being. 
and that's Definitely. when you see like the t the way the timeline works and some of the dialogue and how it one of the things that for me really actually makes sense to this kind of theory as to this is what's going on is the juxtaposition of John and Lydia's scene talking about uh, marriage and all of that stuff with him watching the documentary about the spider. Yes. That he's actually creating a vision in his brain about what John and Lydia are talking about because he knows inherently that she wants to get rid of him and they want to, they want to move on with their lives and go get married and have a life together Absolutely. that's not anchored by taking care of this, this special needs guy. Um, so you're saying, like, like, that sort of, like, like watching that documentary kind of sparks the idea that, like, that's what happened. I think all of it is in his brain. I think okay. all of the scenes between Lydia and John are him thinking about what they would talk about, thinking about how they're plotting, thinking about what an adult relationship is like. Like, okay. I don't think he has any real, actual, concrete understanding beyond a certain point because of how his brain works. So th what we're watching is kind of like a, a keyhole into that. So, 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 so essentially like the entire film as presented, everything that we see is his filtered version. I think so. No, no, I, I'm very I into think that so. idea. I'm very into that idea. I yeah, think so. I because mean, that, that, that would even then further lend to the ability to, to, to let go into the fractured nature of the film as a whole. Listen, it's a leap. I think I think I think it could be a leap and it might be a bigger leap for for somebody more so than than someone else. And I think that's fair. I think that for me specifically, when I watch the film, I feel like that's what I'm watching. I feel like he sets out from the beginning by saying, "I'm narrating this. I'm telling you this story." Right. And at, by the end, he shows you where he actually is. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he flat out tells you at the start that I'm, he's doing it. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm there you go. I'm telling you this thing. And because the initial, the initial script was titled The Storyteller, and it's you're telling yourself your own story, I actually think that's what it is. I think it's all a filtered version through Dennis's eyes of what, of what his life is like. With the addition of, of the original title, actually, that makes 100% sense. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of fun to me when I talk to somebody who's seen it because I do think that there that it, that it is open to interpretation. I have talked to people who totally think that Michael Berryman's character is an actual physical, tangible being from an interdimensional place that comes in through this mirror. And but there, there, Andrew presents no history of this mirror. We don't know what this mirror is. Why this mirror is in this right, house? Right. It, it's an odd. It's an odd plot point. It's 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 strange. But it is the thing that kind of sets everything in motion. And what is a mirror? It's you look at yourself. To me, the entire the entirety of the 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 film makes sense for me the most when it's looked through Dennis's eyes, when it is his actual remembrances and his opinions on everybody that's there. Because I don't think a rational view of him could entail him like flipping out from flipping down from the thing and uh, the, the the manipulation of time all of that feels like a dream it feels like a memory none of it is completely cohesive well it's interesting that you bring you bring up the flip as uh, as something that you appreciated in terms of the character and in in this way because that's when i talk to people who say that they love the movie every now and then they'll be like hey I, I, they lost me a little bit when he came out of the vent but and, but like, with that filter yeah, of it being all 100% his head, like, it makes, yeah. Like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if ultimately that's what the film is. I, I can tell you that I think that this kind of, like, weird, wormholy quality to the film, I feel is was intentional. I think that Andrew set out to create something that was open to interpretation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in that regard, I feel as justifiable having that opinion as somebody who thinks something completely different. I think there's room for both. Absolutely. Um, in it. Well, I, earlier when I was saying that you know, like, like the, the quality of the, of the effects vary. That that wasn't to say that, that it, it, it would in any way hindered my ability to enjoy the film. It was just something that I, I noticed. How, and I was curious as to why the differences in in the quality were there. But even then, like it absolutely like. The, the quickness of the effect uh, where, where the, the one Scar Brothers slits in the Scar Brothers throat, um, it was 
you know, when, 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 when it turns into Dennis and walks away, like it, it, at first I was like, I don't understand the visual after, you know, with, with, with the rest of the sequence and just the craziness that's going on. Like it just, it works. It works. It does work. It, I mean, listen, it's, it's funny that way. Like there are things about it that are, that are, um, I don't. It, 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 it's true. When, look, listen. When you when you talk about the film, sometimes when you when when you it's like you have to preface it by saying I'm not saying it it, it stops the enjoyment of the film. Th- there are things about it that are jarring. Yeah. Th- there th- and and some of it is just visually. Like some some things don't totally work as seamlessly as maybe one would hope. Or, yeah. That, that's all I meant. That's yeah. all I'm getting at. Yeah. Totally, I, and I think that's fair. Totally, Michael. But yeah. I, I think that one of the things that's really odd about it is, in retrospect, there is something about that that actually does seem to add something positive Absolutely. to the experience. Absolutely, which is really weird. It's really strange and unique that way. Yeah. No, I just because I brought up a couple of times. Where, was that in effect using both Sklar brothers, or was? Or, oh, they, they were both there. They, what? They, okay, they were both there. See, I'm, I'm, I'm a big imp- improv comedy fan, and so like when they popped into the movie, I was like, oh my god, it's those guys. And yeah. then um, I, I forget the fellow's name, but uh, there's uh, the guy that John finds out that the taxi during Jeremy Bucks are actually Dennis's uh-huh. from. I'm a, I, like I'm a big fan of his arcs on. Uh, you think Grace and Frankie? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was it was it was, it was like oh, hey, these comedy people I like. So, like, like, did, 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 did uh, do you know about how, how they got involved in the film at all? Like, I don't. Okay. No, I have no idea. I mean, listen, one of the funny things about my experience on the film was that it was somewhat isolated. I mean, most of the stuff was just me talking to myself in a mirror. Brilliantly, then, but yeah. <laughs> and then, I, I, I think that the, the, the person that I worked with the most was Michael Berryman. And really, that was not very long. I mean, my time with him was pretty limited in the, in the grand scheme of, of a shooting schedule. Right. And then I probably worked with John and uh, uh, with Sean and Dina for maybe a week, week and a half. Really, that's it. Okay, two weeks. All right. Like off and on, you know. I mean, I would see them and they would be shooting their stuff, and I I knew I knew them kind of offset, but not actually us on a stage or in a in a scene together. I don't have that many that many scenes with them, really. So when you think about it, like they're impactful, but yeah, but there really aren't that that many of them, right? Most of their stuff is between each other. And most of my stuff is by myself or with or with Michael Berryman. Yeah. So w- what was Berryman like? He's lovely. He's he's a true, and this is this is uh, kind of the best way for me to to describe him. He's a true gentleman. He's extraordinarily sweet, good natured. He's very very kind. He's very very patient. He's lovely. Did and you... an icon. Oh, yeah, as far absolutely. as I'm concerned. Yeah. yeah. Did, did did you guys talk at all about his career? Or... Uh, no, not really. When when he, you know. God bless him, but he would show up and he would show up to set and go immediately into makeup. I mean, the amount of full body makeup that he did, because you know he wasn't using a lot of prosthetics. Right. Um, outside of what I remember, he had some really uncomfortable, really thick contact lenses that okay. he would put in his eyes, and he had fake, uh, like a mouthpiece uh, teeth. I was like, was it teeth? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, I noticed that yeah. once they were in, made speaking really, really difficult. So there was a lot of sign language. There was a lot of you know, like patting him on the shoulder, making <laughs> sure we were in the in the right kind of you know vicinity for what we were doing. Um, but when he was fully in that makeup, he had a lot of trouble seeing and a lot of trouble talking. So, yeah, I I think and the the, the actual painting of his body took hours. It, hours. It was worth it. It's it's all up there on the screen and. It, Reads. I mean, like, it, I think outside of a speedo, it, that's all <laughs> paint. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I actually found really interesting about Barryman's character was that it, like, watching it, it felt like his teeth were too big for his mouth, but that led to a creep factor. Yeah. Because, could, because he had to speak more slowly to be understood, and it was like, ah! like, yeah, 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 man. That's that's really interesting to hear though that 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 it, that it was in fact a mouthpiece and. Okay. Yeah, he had some kind of a some kind of a an upper and lower teeth prosthetic, I guess okay. is how you would how you would describe it. And it did, it made speech really difficult. Alright. Right on. We have covered quite a bit about about this and I am just thrilled that this conversation is even happening in my life right now. Oh but, dude, pleasure. Uh, Absolute pleasure. Alright. Sweet sneezes, folks. That was just one of the most amazing conversations I have ever gotten to have, and it's not even the entire conversation. 
So come back next week, and I'm going to throw up a few more random discussion topic teasers like last week, and then the following week will be the conclusion of the Fred Kohler interview in which we discuss highlights from his rather long career. I'm just thankful to be the person that got to do all this. So thank you for choosing to spend your very valuable time with me. I have been Michael Donahue, and this is Riot Monkey Radio.